Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a discussion video uh, just to say that I will have my final wrap up of the year um, probably around Christmas and then obviously my top reads of the year uh, just before New Year's Day. Um, but I, I've noticed something over the last couple of years and I just wanted to throw it open uh, for your thoughts. So I'm not exactly sure when I joined Booktube. I sort of S sort of slipped over into it. I was already making the old video about books, but I noticed with Goodreads that I seem to have joined them about 2015, so seven years ago. Um, so let's assume, for sake of argument, that I've been making booktube videos for five years, um, and over the course of those five years I've exponentially increased my reading. So I'm comfortably reading over 100 books every year, mostly fiction, uh, whereas before that I was doing sort of between 30 and 40. And in doing that I've been inspired by uh, the comments and responses and discussions beneath my videos but also watching other booktubers and getting recommend recommendations to plug holes in my backlist because I'm actually very badly read. Right, certainly was. Um, but gradually as I read more and more and watched more and more booktube videos I, I sort of became more aware of new release, uh, newly published books, sorry new releases is from my days working in a record shop, more of which uh, will crop up in this discussion video um, because I'm not again I'm not plugged into sort of publishers and what their sort of lists for next year are and any of that um, so I kind of rely on, on booktube mainly, Twitter to a lesser extent um, to, to alert me to what's, what's going to be published that might be of interest to me in the forthcoming year. And I've noticed that as I've read and consumed more and more authors and, and got sort of more and more uh, passions and manias for certain authors, that when uh, they have a new book out, uh, I eagerly anticipate it. Uh, and over the course of the last two years they've uniformly let me down. And my question first of all is has anyone else felt this but more importantly is that me or is that on the authors and that's what I wanted to expand uh, this discussion to. Um, so when I say I eagerly anticipate it I'm not um, sort of dressing up in Harry Potter gear and standing outside the bookshop at midnight for the doors to open to get it as soon as possible. I've never been that type of person. Music, my other great love. I only ever, to my memory, um, sort of dashed out from school at the end of the school day, got on the bus to the local shopping centre in order to buy a new album release on its day of release. Um, I can only remember doing that once. Uh, and uh, on that occasion it was well rewarded. It was probably my favourite band of the time and the difference between music and books is uh, in a way a test of the greatness of an album and yes I still deal in albums, that's my generation and age. Uh, the test of a great album is one that you just keep wanting to play over and over and over again. Uh, it's hard to do that with books. I'm not a, I'm not a big re-reader. Um, so I was never that type of person, even in my other great passion, as I say, of music, who, who had to have books on on uh, the, the day of new release. I'm, you know, I've not applied to NetGalley to get ahead of the curve on, on new releases, getting early, early copies. Uh, publishers don't send me stuff, although, you know, <laughs> well, I would welcome that if that happened. Um, so, I, you know, when I say I, I greatly anticipate, I'm still there waiting for the day of release. I'm not. I'm not sort of moving heaven and earth to get ahead of ahead of it. And there have been several, as I say, books over the last two years. I've been really looking forward to as new releases from authors I particularly like, and they've been huge letdowns. So I'll just give you a, a, a few examples. So this was the early King and the Kid in the Yellow by Irish writer Danny Denton, and it was his debut novel. It came out in. Uh, 2018 um, and then this year we had his second novel the follow-up called All Along the Echo. What I loved about this book was uh, the atmosphere it's slightly dystopian uh, but it's it, the atmosphere was brilliant and and the lyricism of the prose was just wonderful. This is much more prosaic now there's nothing wrong with with sort of writing a more prosaic 
novel. And in a way, it was it set up an interesting uh, world whereby it's set in Ireland, and Ireland is now coming uh, swamped by would-be uh, British refugees from Britain because of a, a series of terrorist attacks that have made life sort of intolerable for many, but also returning Irish uh, emigres who, who, who have come back from England to, to Ireland, which is a really interesting setup. I don't think it was developed enough because ultimately it's a story about a couple of people. One is a radio DJ, the other is his female producer on the show, and they've got sponsorship from a car salesman, I think, whereby they're travelling up and down Ireland, giving away, uh, in this car, which will be, is a prize when it's spotted, and every time it's spotted, those people go into a hat, and then someone's drawn out, they'll win the car. And so it's a sort of a road journey. Uh, but it's really about these, these two characters, sort of personal lives, and it's not that engaging. This is also about the personal life, but it's, it's done in a much more imaginative, thrilling way, because the kid is sort of on the fringes of a of a sort of the, the one of the big criminal gangs who who run this sort of dystopian island they sort of they they uh, oversee and control trade in everything not just in drugs but in all supplies and uh he falls in love with the gang leader's daughter and uh gets her pregnant and uh all hell ensues and the kid uh, and the kid has to go on the run with the baby being chased by the gangster so somehow it feels much bigger much more apocalyptic even on the human scale than this ever does so i mean this was solid enough uh it was good enough writing i think i gave three and a half or four stars but compared to this which blew me away this was a bit of a disappointment then we come to Love and Other Thought Experiments, the debut novel by Sophie Ward, which got on one of the prize book lists, uh, long lists. I can't remember which one now. And this was published in 2020. And it's a wonderfully inventive, multi-genre love story. Um, so a bit like that, in that the world that's created here is big enough or expands the significance of, of the interpersonal relationships. And I loved it. It was fantastic. And then this year we had the follow-up, The Schoolhouse by Sophie Ward, uh, which again is of a completely different feel. And again, the writer has the, has the, the right to choose to write whatever they want. And in a way, many first-time authors, the book has been sitting with them. It's the story they've always wanted to tell for you know, many, many years across their life. And when they finally get it written and published, it's like a big sort of sort of uh, purging, really, of this thing that's been a huge part of their life for so long. So the second book becomes, uh, do you do a rewrite, rewritten version of that as you've thought of some more things that have come out of it? Or do you go in a wholly other direction, which this does? So as inventive uh, and multi-genre as this, this is a fairly pedestrian crime uh, police procedural thing involving child abuse. Here, the love story is front and centre. Here, there is a love story between two female policemen or detectives, very much on the down low because it's frowned upon within the force. But it's not. It, it's much more about the abuse and the violence um, than the love story. And I'm afraid this really was disappointing compared to the expectations that that had done. As I say, she has the right to do that. And it's interesting that in the music business... Uh, again, the sort of 70s, 80s, 90s, when I was much more active, I actually worked in the industry to some extent, um, that there was this thing known as the difficult third album, that the debut album, you know, launched a band, the follow-up album was eagerly anticipated, and the third album was, well, what you got left, either you're just churning out more of the same, or you've, you've run out of ideas, you're bankrupt, or you've tried to go in, in a new direction and you haven't pulled it off. In my one of, in one of the novels I'm writing now, I make the point that it, you you don't get three albums in the in the book trade. You get two books. I mean, you're lucky if you get a two book deal anyway. But if you do, you'll probably be cut loose <laughs> after the second book. Um, you know, no matter how good the debut was. And and you know, I felt that this has second book syndrome in the same way as you had the difficult third album. This, the case of this is slightly different. The Doll's Alphabet uh, by uh, Canadian author Camilla Grudeau. This is a book of short stories, and uh, as I said in my recent review of her first debut novel, which came out very recently, um, 
I'm not big on short stories. This is possibly the last short story collection that I read that I actually enjoyed. So I would never sort of go mad on an author based on a book of their short stories if that was their debut, which is very common for authors in the publishing industry today. They often give the author a, see how they, they do by offering them a short story collection first before they offer them a, a, a full novel. Um, but I was intrigued enough by this uh, collection to remember the name. So she's finally uh, released her debut novel called Children of the Paradise, and I hated it. Absolutely hated it. I thought two and a half stars. It just had nothing to me. Um, but it's a slightly different case because I was interested and intrigued, but not eagerly anticipating, because as I say, all I had to launch off was a book of short stories, and I'm always very wary of, of in launching into enthusiasm based on short stories. Then onto one of my favourite novelists, or I thought he was, uh, Laurent Binet. Uh, the Seventh Functional Language and HHHH. His first two novels, or at least the first two of his that have been translated into English. Love, love, love them both. They would get into my top 50, 100 books easily. And then last year we got uh, his third novel, follow-up called Civilizations, which was Drek. It's a sort of alternative speculative history reversing, instead of... Um, uh, Central and Southern America being being conquered by the Spanish. This is uh, the Incas and Aztecs. I think it's the Aztecs uh, manage to turn the tables and they end up invading uh, Europe. Um, but it's it's pointless. I couldn't see to what point he was doing. There's one good gag in it, but that's about it. Um, yeah, this was so disappointing. And now it leads me very much in two minds. Is Well, maybe Pina isn't that great. I mean, these two books are great. Would I reread them? Because I know the shtick. I mean, they're both very funny, but also deal in academia uh, as well. And, and I've kind of got it. I know it. I mean, this obviously also deals in, in sort of faux academia, but far less successfully and far less amusingly. So I will definitely want to read his follow-up fourth novel, but, I, you know, I'm not going to figuratively queue outside the bookshop at 12 midnight or get Amazon to deliver it in hardback on the day of publication. I may just wait for the paperback because this so grievously wounded my uh, sort of perception and adoration of, of what these have delivered. And on to Tom McCarthy. He's written several novels and I've liked them all. I mean, they're a varying uh, um, sort of devotion on my part. So this is C, uh, which got on the Booker shortlist, didn't win, unfortunately. This was Satin Island, which I think was a follow-up to C, which is a deeply flawed book, but so enjoyable. I mean, I love, I love Satin Island. So I'm a big McCarthy fan. I like his mind. I like what he's trying to do with literature. Uh, and then finally, we get a follow-up. So Satin Island was published in 2015. Quite a while ago, and then finally we got Incarnation, the Making of Incarnation, which is the follow-up, which was published in uh, 2021. So quite a gap. And in a way, this is not dissimilar to the rest of his oeuvre. Lots of great ideas, really interesting sort of intellectual debates, but it's not really a novel. It doesn't hold together as a novel. Um, but there was enough good ideas in it that I still got value out of this book. I'm not saying it, it was, you know, Drek like uh, the Gradova. Um, but it was unsatisfying. And again, makes me, feel, you know, this is hardback. I got it, I think, delivered by Amazon on the day it was published. Would I be in such a race for the next one? I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I'm still a big fan of Tom McCarthy. But this was a bit of a letdown. And on to Percival Everett. So I have read some of his early books, liked him. He's sort of quite postmodern. Hadn't, you know, he wasn't in my sort of pantheon of great, of great favoured authors. Um, but then, obviously, uh, this came out, The Trees, which is just brilliant and, and reignited my my interest in him. And earlier this year, I read uh, a book of his called Telephone, which I think was published either just before or just after The Trees. When was this published? Yeah, 2020, so I think just before The Trees. And this was very good, but it wasn't his latest, because I knew, come November 2022, that this was being released, uh, Dr. No. 
And this is this is so ho hum, so you know, so so what really? But the thing about Percival Everett is he's written thirty novels. You're not going to like them all. Um, so the trees is brilliant. I love Telephone. I love Glyph and Erasure. But there have been others in his books like So Much Blue, where I was ho hum and I was ho hum about this. So. This is a slightly different case. I was disappointed in it. As a new release, it fell into my lap. I read it and I went, shrugged my shoulders. But I didn't have quite the anticipation uh, that I have for some of these other authors. I mean, interestingly, some of those other authors are debut authors, whereas, you know, as I say, Everett's got a huge back catalogue. Um, and just to say that, you know, as I said, I've really sort of exponentially increased my reading over the last few years, and it's only in those last few years that I've discovered some of my all-time favourite authors, like David Markson, like Ben Marcus, uh, like Valeria Luiselli, uh, like Clarice Lispector. And Lispector and Markson, for example, have never let me down with a book, but the point is they're both, they're both dead. There are, there's no new releases to anticipate. Yes, they might, you know, Lispector, there might be a new work in translation. But interestingly, her books have been translated in the order in which obviously the translators and the publishers felt that there was going to be a market for them. We're now very much in the dregs of the Spectre. So there were two books were published, were translated for the first time into English a couple of years ago. And they're not great. They're not great. But there's not that sense of anticipation with Markson because he can't produce anymore. And with the Spectre, who also can't produce anymore, even though we may see, you know, a new title pop up every now and again, but it's not new. Um, the, the thing about Markson is, I'm so enamoured with his work, I'm actually going to, I've just ordered his three earliest works, which were paid for commissions, sort of pulp fiction. I'm that obsessed with him. You know, I don't expect these to be great works of literature. I'm looking at what Markson brings to fairly, a fairly standard fare. Um, so there's lot, there's lots of, examples of authors who are up there in my pantheon but there's you know there's nothing to anticipate there's nothing new to anticipate so it doesn't apply to them Michel Huelbeck submission the map of the territory I mean, I pretty much always liked everything he's done again slightly patchy across his oeuvre but you know they've all got merits and then a couple of years ago we had serotonin his, his last work really disappointing. I think this is a slightly different case. It just so happened that the, 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 the story and the subject of this book, set in the world of sort of French agriculture and how it's struggling in the 21st century with the EU subsidies and bureaucracy and, and sort of cheaper imports and all of that, very valid. And I think he paints a very good picture of, of the crisis with the French countryside, but it's just not one I was very interested in. So that's not really Huelbeck's fault, but when you're not carried away with the, with the subject of the book, you're thrown back on the style. And, and, and the thing about Huelbeck is very often there are great parts of his writing where it looks like he's phoned it in. And when you're thrown back onto that without any of the redeeming features to offset it, <laughs> that becomes a problem. So, you know, as I say, I just wonder if anyone else has got this sense of feeling. So another, uh, another book which I haven't actually pulled from my... Uh, in fact, another two books which I haven't pulled from my bookshelves, is um, Anthony Mara, who wrote the inestimable, wonderful book, The Constellation, A Constellation of Vital Phenomena, and also another very good book. Uh, which was flawed, but has some wonderful ideas in it. Anyway, finally, we get a new book for, by him. He's a bit like Geoffrey Eugenides, who Eugenides only publishes every 10 years, so it's hard to build up anticipation for Eugenides. Mara's not quite as bad as every 10 years for a book, but there's, there's long gaps between them. Anyway, so we had his new book this year called Mercury Pictures Presents. And everything about the first two novels, the endearing characters, the brilliant sort of observation of very strange but real parts of history, were missing in, in Mercury Pictures Presents. It's set in Hollywood, it's set in a studio, it's set in a struggling studio, and it's stuff you kind of know or you can imagine because you've seen it before in lots of Hollywood movies and lots of books. It wasn't remarkable enough, so it was underwhelming. It still had some very, very good bits, which I really enjoyed and got a lot out of. But as a whole, it was a bit of a letdown, unfortunately. Um, the other was Jennifer Egan's uh, book, uh, The Candy House, 
Uh, I was really looking forward to this. Uh, I've read all of Egan's work, even Manhattan Beach I like, or I like two thirds of Manhattan Beach. Love, love, love A Visit from the Goon Squad. I didn't realise that this was... But that's not the issue. The issue is just how badly put together it is. It's just, there's nothing really to keep you turning the pages. Um, it was just dire. Again, two, I mean, it really was two stars for me. And I've heard, I don't know if this is true, but I've heard that her next book uh, will, will be also be set in that world. And as much as she's one of my favourite authors, I ain't buying it. I'm not interested. She did that world brilliantly. She had no, in my opinion, she had no need to revisit it and and spoil its, its sort of legacy, really. So next year, the only book, the only book I'm, I'm aware of that is being published uh, as a new release is uh, a new novel from Han Kang, Korean uh, writer. So she's released three books, uh, each very different from each other, each though equally good. So she's in my pantheon, definitely. But I have a slight feeling of dread. Yeah, what if what if this book does the new book doesn't live up to expectations? How do I downgrade my expectations to a sort of more reasonable level where I can therefore react to the book maybe in a more measured way and deal with it in its own merits rather than my inflated expectations? I don't know. That's what I'm throwing over to you guys. Or whether the problem lies with me and I somehow need to rein in my expectations so I can deal with the book. So yeah, I'm throwing it over to you. I'd love to see what you guys